We'll return to the topic of Frederick George and Chambers in a moment. An important figure in those early years for you, I believe, was Edward St John. Oh, yes, Ted was a wonderful fellow and it was a pleasure ultimately in 1983 to go into Chambers with him in the MLC building on the 43rd level and I had the room next to him um, and I was a silk at that stage too so we were both leaders of the floor but he was a remarkable person, remarkable person and I, as, a, as a junior barrister I did lots of work with him and I was never ceased to be amazed at his command of detail. It was just superb. Can you recall any cases in particular in which you were junior to him that where you got to see his skills in full flight? I can remember a little about one of them, which was a federal customs case where our client had come into the country with a bag of diamonds and they were confiscated um, and it was alleged that he was smuggling, smuggling them into the country and we made an application to recover the diamonds in, I think it was the Federal Magistrates Court, I can't remember at the time, a building down in Phillips Street, the other end of Phillips Street, not this end, and Ted was masterful in his cross-examination of the customs officers and he had required that the diamonds be produced and they had them in a bag and they had a tray uh, in front of the witness and opened the bag and all of these diamonds, some of them quite large, um, came out onto the tray and he then cross-examined about these diamonds. I was quite jealous. I wanted one for myself or my wife. <laughs> so when you were working with him, you were saying he had a um, masterful quality about him. Did much of his advocacy style rub off on you? Well, I hope a little bit did. Um, I'm not sure that I was ever as good an advocate anywhere near as Edward St John. Um, but I liked him very much. He also was a latent greenie, as you know, and took a lot of interest in very early environmental standoff fights. Why do you think that was? I'm, I'm kind of interested to know more about him as a figure because he was also very politically active. Well, he was a member of Parliament for Warringah in, um, in the Liberal Party, although a thorn in their side, as you know. Um, he would never compromise his principles. Um, he just had a great affection for the land, I think. And that, of course, rubbed off on you, but you, you had your own latent interest. Oh, yes, yes. No, I was always... I became, certainly in the 60s and 70s, very interested in planning issues, local government issues, environmental law issues. And it was the very early days of environmental law. Things were starting to happen in um, the late 70s. There was an article written not long ago in the Sydney Morning Herald by Elizabeth Farrelly about... And it's a perennial question in, in these sorts of matters. It's time to take the me out of planning. Would you have agreed with that in the 60s, you, you and Edward St John, when you were doing those early years of practice? Um, I don't know. I think there needs to be room for the me in planning. Um, I think that planning can't be a wholly objective practice, and it isn't, and we have to face that. And I certainly think that residents are entitled to have their particular concerns addressed and, um, if necessarily, acted upon. So in the 60s, were there any particular cases that you worked on that involved the balancing of those elements, if you like, that you'd like to recall for us? Um, not in the 60s, I don't think there were. They probably started to be in the 70s, and I used to do quite a lot of local government and planning, as it was known then. Um, there's no particular cases. It was a sort of slow evolution of principles, and it wasn't until the Environment Planning and Assessment Act of 1979 that started in 1980 and the creation of the Land and Environment Court that there was any real jurisprudence that started to um, develop. 